when I look at the younger generation, I despair of the future of civilization. Not a letter to the times, but written by Aristotle in the year 300 BC. The world is passing through troublesome times. The young people of today think of nothing but themselves. They have no reverence for parents or old age. They are impatient of all restraint and they talk as if they knew everything and what passes for wisdom with us is foolishness to them. As for the girls, they are immodest and unwomanly in speech, behavior, and dress. Not the Evening Standard, but written by a man called Peter the Monk in the year 1274. I am young, but I dare not marry, for the future is so uncertain. William Wilberforce in 1801. There is nothing around us but ruin and despair. William Pitt, 1806. Nothing now can save Britain from the shipwreck. Lord Shaftesbury in 1848. Nowadays life is not worth living with the hustle and bustle. It is just one long process of growing tired. Samuel Butler in 1851. Next year, Disraeli said, in every department of our nation, industry, commerce, and agriculture, there is no hope. And by 1892, the Duke of Wellington, in his prayers, said, I thank God I shall be spared the consummation of ruin that is gathering around us. It all helps to put things in perspective for us. Now let me read a paraphrase of a psalm. And indeed it's a precy because it's a very long psalm. It's high time we stop complaining about the dissipation of our world or the corruption of our society. At the same time we eye with envy those ungodly characters who appear to have more fun or to be more successful than we are. If we really trusted in God and were truly committed to his purposes, the world might be a great deal better off today. God is in our world. He is destined to be the source of our joy and well-being. He is the fulfillment of our heart's desires. And if we dedicate our lives to him and to his will, he will be able to work through us to permeate this world's darkness with divine light. So let's keep cool and try to be patient and stop worrying about the apparent hopelessness of it all. We only contribute to this despair by always being negative and defeatist. God has not taken a vacation. He is here. He has his own way of dealing with the instigators of corruption. It will take time but the victory is ultimately God's. Those who live within God's will shall surely discover that his purposes prevail and that true joy and peace and security come from him. Let us then wait for God and seek daily to obey him. He is our salvation and our security and nothing in this world can take that away from us. Let us calm our hostilities, overcome our anxieties, and walk in peace and love. When I said that was a precy, as well as a paraphrase, the whole psalm is quite a long one. It's got 40 verses. I think I'm going to ask 40 members of the congregation to help me to read the whole psalm. Would you turn to page 556 in the Good News Bible? It's actually Psalm 37, and I'm going to invite 40 of you to read one verse each, and then I just want to draw something out of it at the end. The thing I'd like to draw out of it, did you notice how the wicked and the good are living all together, side by side, mixed up in the same place? And yet as you read through, you get a sense that one of those two groups is going to survive, the other's going to disappear, that one is going to stay in the land and the other's going to go from it. And the other thing I'd like you to notice, maybe you did as we read, 
none of us are particularly eager to read about the wicked. Have you noticed that? When we got to some of those verses, there was just a pause while we screwed up courage to read it. Now for our scripture tonight, I'm going back to a parable which I referred to some weeks ago, but which I've been finding another of those stories which makes a lot of sense of the society in which we live. Matthew chapter 13, that's page 20 in the New Testament of the Good News Bible. We start at verse 24, Matthew 13, 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man sowed good seed in his field. One night when everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the plants grew and the ears of corn began to form, then the weeds showed up. The man's servants came to him and said, Sir, it was good seed you sowed in your field. Where did the weeds come from? It was some enemy who did this, he answered. Do you want us to go and pull up the weeds, they asked him. No, he answered, because as you gather the weeds, you might pull up some of the wheat along with them. Let the wheat and the weeds grow, both grow together until harvest. Then I will tell the harvest workers to pull up the weeds first, tie them in bundles and burn them, and then to gather in the wheat and put it in my barn. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man takes a mustard seed and sows it in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows up, it is the biggest of all plants. It becomes a tree so that birds come and make their nests in its branches. Jesus told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A woman takes some yeast and mixes it with 40 liters of flour until the whole batch of dough rises. Jesus used parables to tell all these things to the crowds. He would not say a thing to them without using a parable. He did this to make what the prophet had said come true. I will use parables when I speak to them. I will tell them things unknown since the creation of the world. When Jesus had left the crowd and gone indoors, his disciples came to him and said, Tell us what the parable about the weeds in the field means. Jesus answered, the man who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the people who belong to the kingdom. The weeds and the people who be- are the people who belong to the evil one. And the enemy who sowed the weeds is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and harvest workers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered up and burnt in the fire, so the same thing will happen at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels to gather up out of his kingdom all those who cause people to sin and all others who do evil things, and they will throw them into the fiery furnace where they will cry and grind their teeth. Then God's people will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Listen then, if you have ears. For centuries, philosophers have been grappling with one of the major questions raised by life, namely the problem of evil in our world. And there are two questions which philosophers have had to ask. Number one, how did it originate? How was it introduced? And number two, how can it be eradicated? Sorry about the big words, let's go back to ordinary English. How did evil get in and how can we get it out? These are the two burning issues and philosophers have argued about these two questions for century upon century. They're such important questions and they're so related to my daily life and yours that I would be astonished if they were not dealt with and answered in this book and especially in the teaching of Jesus and that is exactly what we find in fact these very two questions are in one story which Jesus told which we've just read the question how was evil introduced into our world is in this parable the question 
where did these weeds come from? And the question, how do we eradicate evil, is to be found in the question, do you want us to go and pull these weeds up? So we're right into the heart of a very profound issue which runs right through our society. There are very few who do not admit the existence of an awful amount of evil in our world. Mary Baker Eddy did try and deny its reality and founded Christian Science and tried to teach her followers that if they could only think of evil as a negative charge, as something not quite real, then that might be the way to overcome it. But evil is only too real. You only need to open one newspaper or listen to one news bulletin or just listen to what Neil Rowe has shared with us to know that we live in an evil world. How did that evil get in? And how are we going to get it out? Now the answer of Jesus is to be found in a very simple story. We won't have any difficulty understanding this story for Jesus himself told us its meaning. Where we will have difficulty is in accepting what he says and in applying it, particularly in applying it. But let's look at the story first. It's a story that is again utterly normal, true to life. Anybody listening to him would understand what he was talking about. He's saying a man had a field, he sowed wheat in it, and one night an enemy came and sowed tares in it. That's all. Do you know that still goes on in parts of the world? I'm told that in India, if you want to threaten a man, you say to him, I will sow bad seed in your field. Certainly in Ireland, at the time of all the evictions, some of the disgruntled tenants who were being thrown off the land their family had farmed for generations, before they left, gathered all the wide, wild oats they could and sowed their land with wild oats which therefore made the land virtually unfarmable for whoever took their land over. That's the origin of the saying, sowing your wild oats, incidentally. So this was very understandable. What they did in Palestine, they used a thing called darnel. I don't know if you know the plant, but it has some rather peculiar qualities. The first is that for the first few months of its growth, there is no way of telling the difference between that weed and wheat. It looks identical. Not until they begin to head out and form the seeds can you tell the difference between a tear and a grain of wheat. It's a narcotic, it's a mild poison. It gives a very bitter taste to the flower, even a touch of it. But if there's a lot of it, it can be quite dangerous and it acts like a narcotic. And so if you were really malicious and really angry with someone, you would get some of that seed and gather it from the darnels in the hedgerows and while the man was asleep, you'd just throw it in his field and he would have a big problem. The only thing he could do really would be to try and pull some of it up or if he went right through to harvest, he would have to hire a lot of women who would sit around the grain and pick out every seed of darnel. It would be grey compared with the golden wheat. But they would have to pick it out by hand, a long, tedious and expensive business. It was a very dirty trick to play, but very well known. And Jesus takes this dirty trick and takes this very understandable situation which would be immediately real to his hearers. And he said, now, if you look carefully into that story, I can teach you something about the principles of God's government which apply to the problem of evil in our society. Isn't it extraordinary that Jesus could take these very ordinary little incidents that everybody was familiar with and just put a little twist in them and that little twist opened up an understanding of how God works in society. Why things are as they are. And there are many people who are asking that kind of question. Why is God allowing worldwide recession? Why is he allowing runaway inflation? Why is he allowing what is happening in Iran to happen? Why? And the answer is to be found in this simple little story. Well now let's look at the two questions. How evil was introduced 
And I'll simply call that the situation in which we are, the situation, how it came about. And then we're going to look at how evil can be eradicated, the solution to the situation. So I've only got two points tonight, the situation in which evil is doing so much damage and the solution to that situation according to the understanding of Jesus. Now let's first of all look at this question, how did evil get in here? And now I'm flooded with answers to that question from all kinds of people looking for a natural cause of evil. There are those who tell me it is an evolutionary hangover and that if only I were a few centuries further away from my great-great-grandfather in the jungle, then there would be less evil in my heart. There are not many today who are hanging on to that theory that evolutionary is a hangover from our jungle origins because if that were so, then 20th century men ought to be much further away from evil than first century men, but he's not. And we have done as devilish and barbaric things in our century as man has done at any other time. Then there are those who say that evil has come from the economic system under which most of us have lived, whereby the means of production have been in the hands of the few to make them rich and to make the many poor. And from that unjust and unequal situation comes the evil of men's greed and their pride and all the other sins. One of the reasons why communism appeals so much is precisely because it says if we can get the right economic system, evil disappears. I went to college with uh, a man called and we were fellow students. We were on the Students' Representative Council of the University together. I think I was the only Christian on it and he was the only communist. But I remember him having a party at the age of 27, celebrating with his fellow communists that though he was the son of a wealthy manufacturer in this country who had said that if he was still a communist on his 27th birthday, he would be disinherited from a huge fortune and I remember seeing Peter and his friends hold a party to celebrate his freedom from that capitalistic system. Why, I asked, should a man who was going to inherit so much celebrate the day when he lost it? And when you talk to him, he was a fine man with a fine brain, but he honestly believed that evil was due to our economic system. And he was prepared to let all that money go and to throw himself wholeheartedly into the communist cause because he believed that evil would be solved. There are those who think it's simply a matter of being overcrowded on a small planet. I read recently of an experiment with rats in a box and as soon as the population of the rats became too many for convenient moving within the box, then there appeared antagonisms and hostilities and ultimately they fought each other and there are those who say that's the answer. Birth control all round, limit the population, get it down to right size and evil would disappear and human greed and wars would go. Against all that, Jesus comes in with his own understanding of the problem and it's quite different. There is no natural cause for evil, that's Jesus' answer. And therefore that marks him apart from many of the modern philosophers who are wrestling with this problem. Before we look at the three things that Jesus says about evil and our situation, just notice the incredible claim that he slips into the story. The claim is this. A certain man had a field and he sowed seed in his field. In giving the interpretation later in the house when the crowds had left, Jesus just said, the man is myself. Or to put it simply, listen carefully, this is incredible, I own the world. It's just slipped in so much as a kind of little phrase that you might not notice. And yet there is a human being living in the Middle East 2,000 years ago 
saying the real solution comes when you first of all realize that the whole world belongs to me. If you're going to think about this problem of evil, realize that this is mine, all of it. The world is the field and the field belongs to the owner and the owner is the son of man. That's an incredible claim. He then goes on to call the field not only the world but his kingdom. And here I want to tell you something very important that you must grasp. The whole world is the kingdom of Christ, not just the church. The kingdom of Christ is much bigger than the church, much larger than those who acknowledge him. The kingdom of Christ covers all 4,000 million people on this world. They're all in his kingdom. They're not all in his church. But he owns the world and everybody walking the surface of this planet belongs to the kingdom of Jesus. Indeed, his last words to his disciples were, All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, all of it. I own the world. That's my kingdom. There may be rebels in it. There may be those who do not accept my government in it, but it's my kingdom. The world is the field, and I'm the owner. Now, having noticed that, he then says three things about evil which are fundamental to every Christian's understanding of evil. And we cannot tackle it properly unless we grasp them. Number one, evil is alien. It has no right to be here. It does not belong here. It was not here to begin with. The law didn't make it. And we must never, never, never think that God is responsible for evil in the world. He did not put it here. It is not natural. It is an invader. It is alien. It is a foreigner. It was not meant to be here. And I believe that deep down within every human heart there is an echo to that truth. I believe that fundamentally every human being who's got any sense of decency at all has a feeling that evil is foreign and that it should be pushed out that it does not belong to the realm of human happiness and that evil is an enemy invading territory to whom it doesn't belong. Now the second thing that Jesus says, which many, many people today would not accept, is that evil is personal. Evil is personal. It's not a force. It's not something you can wrap up in a brown paper package. It's not like gravity or electricity. You cannot say of evil, it. You can only say, he. Evil cannot exist apart from people. You cannot say evil is an it. How can we get rid of it? You have to say, how can I get rid of him? If you're really going to understand the problem of evil. In other words, Jesus believed in a personal devil. That may seem old-fashioned, or it did until about ten years ago, when at least some kind of belief in the devil began to creep back onto stage and screen and into our literature. But do people really believe in a personal, evil power who is more subtle, more clever than I am? Jesus did. And he said he is the one responsible for the evil in the world. There are many things said about the devil in this story that I want you to take note of. First, the devil usually works secretly. You don't notice when he's working. He often does it when men are asleep. He can be busy in your dreams. But when nobody's looking, he's busy. It also tells you that the devil loves to counterfeit. Planting tares that would look exactly like wheat for the first few months at any rate, was absolutely typical. If the devil walked into this church dressed in black with a forked tail and horns, we would have no problem with him. We once had a worshipper of Satan standing on our front doorsteps here, you may remember, and he was dressed in black from head to toe, and he stood and glared with his arms folded at every worshipper coming here to meet Jesus. You may remember that. But at least he gave us the help of dressing up like that. The devil doesn't usually do that. He prefers to come as an angel of light. If he comes in the light at all. 
But he loves to plant something that looks good until it grows up and produces fruit. That's why it is often so difficult to spot when he's busy. He counterfeits what the Lord is doing, which tells me something else about the devil. If the Lord sows a field, the devil doesn't go off and sow tares somewhere else. He wants to get them in there. In other words, wherever the Lord is trying to do something, that's where the devil will be too. He doesn't go away elsewhere. In fact, one of the marks that the Lord is busy is that you're up against the devil too. You'll find he's busy at the same point. Why? Because here's something more. The devil is motivated by nothing more nor less than malice. His aim is totally destructive and it is to undo what the Lord is trying to do. The devil is not trying to build up anything. He's not trying to get a harvest. He's not trying to do anything. He is just so angry and so frustrated and so malicious The only thing he wants to do is to undo anything good. He is, in short, a vandal. He's an invader, he's a squatter, he's a vandal. I'll move on or I could get worked up about him and I don't want to say too much about him for a reason I'll give you later. The third thing that Jesus says about evil in the world, our situation, it is alien, it is personal, and it is embodied The seed the devil sows are people. Satan cannot work unless he can get hold of people through whom he can work. And therefore the tares, says Jesus, represent those who either do Satan's work for him or teach other people to do it. You cannot therefore say, let's try and eradicate evil from the world without realizing that you are saying we're going to have to eradicate a lot of people. If evil is not a thing but a person and a person embodied in other persons, then you cannot eradicate it without eradicating human beings. If only we could learn that lesson. Every war that men fight seems to assume that you've eradicated all the people who serve Satan and within days you discover that you've done nothing of the kind. These insights of Jesus into the problem of evil not only tell us that to eradicate evil we would have to eradicate people, they also tell us that no natural force is ever going to remove the supernatural source of evil. We may remove some of the symptoms, but the actual source will not be able to touch. Now that's our Lord's view of the situation. Let's turn to his understanding of the solution. How can evil be eradicated? How can it be dealt with? Is there a possibility of building a world in which my children and grandchildren will grow up free from evil? Well, look at the stage in the story. It's rather important to realize that this question came up after some months of growing when the wheat and the tares had begun to head out as we call it and had begun to form the seeds by that time the difference began to be noticed and it's then that they came to the owner of the field and said how did these get here and he told them the answer so their second question is now how do we get rid of them do you want us to go and pull them up Now that took me back to 1948. I could take you back to the very field. It's the first on the left past the railway as you go out of Great Ayton in North Yorkshire towards a hill called Rosebury Topping which you can see from Middlesbrough. Does anybody know where I'm talking about? Just a few. Well now the first field on the left past the railway is about 16 acres and I was 16 years of age and I was sent into that field looking Now, only those who come from those parts will know what's meant by that. I didn't know when the farmer said, I want you to go looking in that field this morning and this afternoon and tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon and the next morning. So I said, okay, I'll go and look if you'll tell me what what looking is. And he gave me a thing like a broom handle with a knob at one end and a tiny little blade like a mini spade at the other. And he said, off you go. And what I had to do was to walk up and down that field, taking about a yard and a half width at a time, and spike at everything that wasn't wheat, every dandelion, every thistle, 
Today they'd use a chemical spray, but in those days you went looking, and this thing was a looker. And of all the tedious, boring jobs, I can recommend that to you. So up and down we went in rain or sun, up and down, yard and a half by yard and a half until the 16 acres were done. And that farmer had a reputation through the district for clean corn. And so he could get a good price for his corn from the corn merchant. And when I loaded up the sacks and got the horse and cart out and went down to the corn merchant, I knew that that corn merchant would run it through his fingers and look at it and say, that's a good clean sample. That's how he did it. It's the instinctive human reaction when something bad appears to get rid of it as quickly as possible. It's the normal reaction and these workers came and said to the owner, shall we go and pull those up? It is the instinctive reaction as soon as we've identified evil to want to uproot it, to want to get rid of it. That is our natural moral indignation. And it's astonishing how much moral indignation we are capable of even before we're Christians. And we often carry a bit over into our Christian life if we're not careful. In that bad form, for example, there is a lot of moral indignation in this country at the moment about South Africa because of apartheid. And so because the whites of South Africa have pushed the blacks of South Africa into another part, the whites of Europe are going to push the whites of South Africa into apartheid, wonder who's going to push us into apartheid, and then somebody else will push them. We have this inbuilt natural instinct when we get hold of some bad people, let's get rid of them. I don't know if you've ever been to Hyde Park Corner, or Marble Arch rather, and looked at that triangle in the road where they hung the triangular gallows. It's only 200 years or so since at that spot you could be hung for stealing five shillings or a sheep. As soon as evil people were discovered, you got rid of them, you uprooted them, and the awful side of it was that people came with their families and held picnics at Marble Arch and watched them being hung. It was a day out. The good thing that was happening. Evil was being eradicated and uprooted. Now this is the instinctive human reaction, and it's a very difficult question for Christians. Are we called to go and eradicate evil, to go and try and uproot it? It's a question that is tearing apart our brethren in Latin America at the moment. There is a new theology there called liberation theology, which is asking, should not Christians be involved in revolution? Where there is a corrupt regime, where there is a tyranny, should not the Christian church fight with force for the liberation of innocent people? It's a big question. Dietrich Bonhoeffer had this question when he was imprisoned in Germany. He felt that his Christian duty as a pastor was to join in a plot to go and pull up a tear called Adolf Hitler and to remove the evil in that man from the earth. Unfortunately, they caught him before the plot was fulfilled and he died or was shot in prison as a traitor. It's a question that has arisen to Christians over the ages. It, it led to the Crusades, to the Inquisition. Is our calling to go and pull up the tares? That's the question. It's the instinctive reaction. Now that we know who is responsible, do we go and deal with them? And this is where the human reaction is so different from the heavenly one. They said to the owner, shall we go and pull up the weeds? And the owner said, no. Why did he say no? Not because their idea was wrong, but it was the wrong time to do it and they were the wrong people to do it, that's all. There must someday come a forcible separation of good and evil. There must someday, if there's a God in heaven who's got any justice in his heart, there must come a separation between good and evil. There must be a final settlement. There must be an eradication of evil. God cannot let it go on forever. The trouble is that we're in a hurry and he isn't. And that we want to say, God, let's go and pull them up. And he says, no, this is not the time to do it and you are not the people to do it. Why not? Well, the owner then says something that's 
the main lesson I want to convey to you tonight. He said, your eyes are fixed too much on the weeds. You ought to be thinking about the wheat. And it is possible for Christians so to get their attention fixed on what to do about the weeds that we overlook the more important question of what is best for the wheat. Or to spell it out very bluntly, it is easier for Christians in our day to be obsessed with the evils of our society and not to be concerned as they should be with how to establish the good. It is human to have moral indignation about other people who are doing wrong. You don't need to be a Christian to do that. It is very easy when you found someone else in whom there is evil to be highly indignant, to start a protest movement, to blaze away at them. It's not so easy to give one's life to establishing the good, to getting the wheat grown and mature. And the owner of the field said, my concern is not about the weeds, but about the wheat. What is going to be the effect of what you do upon the wheat? And he goes right back to his original desire when he planted the wheat in that field. His desire was to get a harvest. And he says, if you go about tackling evil the wrong way, I will lose some of my harvest. If you get so obsessed with uprooting tares, you will either make a mistake and pull up some wheat thinking you've got a tear, or the root systems by now being so intertwined in the very pulling up of the tear, you loosen the root system of the wheat and the wheat will not be as strong as it should be. And therefore I command you, let them both grow together. That is a very hard thing to accept and apply in the right way. But in our situation in this nation, I believe this is a word for us. Let them both grow together. Now let's not misapply it. Let none of us ever dare to make this an excuse for letting evil and good grow together within our own hearts. Towards evil in ourselves, the Bible says, be utterly ruthless, murder it, put to death whatever has come through from your old life that's spoiling the new. Murder it, be utterly ruthless, give it no chance to survive. That's within yourself. The owner is not talking about the individual. Jesus is not telling you as a Christian, let evil and good grow together in your life. Nor is he telling this to the church. Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 makes it utterly clear that though we have no right to judge an outsider, we must leave God to judge the outsider. We have the right and responsibility to discipline each other and not just to let good and evil grow together in the church. The field is not the church, it is the world. But it's when we come into the world situation that Christians are on a knife edge. On the one hand, the scripture teaches us absolutely clearly that evil is to be exposed, brought to the light, shown for what it is. But there is not one text in this whole New Testament that I've been able to found, find that lays on the Christian church the responsibility of seeking to eradicate evil in the world. Not one text. Expose it, remain unstained by it, but never uproot it. Why not? Because if we did, the Lord of the harvest would have less of a harvest than otherwise he would have had. When I realized this, I scratched my head a bit and I thought, give me an illustration of that from within the New Testament, Lord. Give me an actual illustration and straight away to my mind there came the day when Jesus and his disciples went through Samaria and they mocked and they jeered and they spat at Jesus. And John, the son of thunder, that fisherman who had a bit of a bad temper, zealous for his Lord, heard that they were saying such things about Jesus, said, shall we call fire from heaven and consume them? Well, you can't fault his faith. 
he shared Elijah's faith. He said, shall we call fire from heaven and consume them? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of, John. That's coming from the human bad-tempered John. It's not coming from an understanding of my heart at this moment. That's John. And within a matter of months, there was a revival in that very place. And the hundreds came to know the Lord and were healed. And there was great joy in that city. And if John's fire had come down and consumed them, what would have happened to the harvest for the Lord? Are you beginning to understand my message? There's something very important here. There will be a day and it will come as certainly as I stand here when the owner of that field says, gather the tares and burn them. But he has not told us to do that. Indeed, it is dangerous to venture into that field if that is our intention. Never avenge yourselves, beloved. Never do it. Vengeance belongs to him. He will repay. There's a day coming when he'll deal with the situation. You don't need to. Let both grow together till the harvest. Psalm 37 seemed to give a picture of wicked and good people living side by side in the same land. That's how the Lord has decided it's going to be until the end of history. And so if we start praying, Lord, will you eradicate evil from the British Isles? I think you're on rather thin ice. I wonder if you're understanding his heart. He wants a big harvest. And you're praying for less of a harvest than he would have. He wants to see people saved. He wants corn in that field. And if my mind is preoccupied with all the weeds and all the evil and all the dirt and all the wrong things, and how can I get rid of those and how can we clean up Britain from that? And I'm not concerned with what's going to happen to the wheat and how that can grow strong and be protected and given good root system. I've got my priorities wrong way around. And that will affect the harvest because I will begin to see people as enemies instead of those for whom Christ died. What this parable is teaching is the Lord's amazing patience and our human impatience. As soon as you become a Christian, you get on the right side, you say, God, why don't you deal with all the evil people? Why don't you deal with all those who refuse your gospel and with all those who doubt? Forgetting that one week previously, if you'd answered that prayer, you'd have been a goner. Isn't it amazing how quickly we become morally indignant and morally impatient with those very people who are living exactly as we lived not long ago, but for the grace of God we'd have been among them. Praise God for his amazing patience, the wisdom of the delay. Whenever you say, why doesn't God do something just ask yourself, if he did, would I be included? And then you'll say, thank you, God, for not doing something. Whenever you say, why don't you bring this day nearer, Lord? Why don't you hurry it up when you're going to take the tares away? Ask yourself, could I be one of the tares? You might find yourself saying, thank you, Lord, that that day didn't come too soon. There will come a day when the tares and the wheat will be divided, and here I must say another thing which is not popular. I believe in hell. I was asked that in a sixth form the other day. I had to say, yes, I do. Not because I like the idea. I can't bear to think about it, really. But I have to believe it because there's one person and one alone in the world who taught it. And that was my Lord Jesus. And when he said... I must one day take those tares and bind them and throw them into the fire. He was talking about people, human beings. And he was talking about a fire that brought conscious agony, suffering, frustration, pain. And he talked about weeping and gnashing of teeth. One almost trembles to read the words. But it's Jesus who said, one day I will have to take those people and I will have to put them in hell. Do you wonder that he said, I want to wait? Do you wonder that he said, I'm putting it off as long as possible? Do you wonder that he said, it, it'll have to be at the end of the story? 
I'm not going to do it now. Praise the Lord that he didn't. His patience has meant that we're here. Look at the wheat for a moment. How does that finish up if the tares finish in fire? The wheat finish up like some of those advertisements you see for breakfast cereal. Field upon field of golden corn in the sun. There's no such heartwarming sight as that to a farmer. To get it just before it goes brown, but when it's really orangey yellow, and when there's a gentle breeze and you just see the sun tracked in reflection in every little ear of wheat. It's, it's a marvelous sight. And Jesus says, the wheat will finish up like that in glory, glory. And he doesn't say in my kingdom, he makes a very subtle little change in my father's kingdom. The irony is that the tares don't belong in the field, but the wheat actually does, but it's not going to stay there. It's going to be taken into the barn and Jesus' kingdom becomes the Father's kingdom and the glory of the corn shines and he has his harvest. Now what is Jesus trying to do in telling the crowd this story? I took my Bible and I just turned back a very few pages to the very last chapter of the very last prophet of the very last book in the Old Testament and the very last page and the very last chapter says this the day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw on that day they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them but for you who obey me my saving power will rise on you like the sun and bring healing like the sun's rays that's the last page of the Old Testament 400 years later and four pages later in your Bible John the Baptist says this he says he's come and he has his winnowing shovel with him to thresh out all the grain and he will gather his wheat into his barn but he will burn the chaff in a fire that never goes out in other words when Jesus came the Jews, including John, expected Jesus to put the baddies in the fire immediately. They'd waited 400 years for someone to come and do that. They knew that God had promised one day that proud and wicked people would burn. And John the Baptist said, he's come and his winnowing shovel is in his hand and he's going to do it. And everybody was waiting for the baddies to be cleared off the earth and burnt. And Jesus did nothing of the kind. And poor John the Baptist in prison scratched his head and said, I don't think he can be the one. And he sent a message to Jesus and said, Jesus, are you the one I talked about? I said it was someone who was coming to burn up the wicked and gather the good into the barn. And what are you doing about it? And Jesus sent a message back. Well, I'm causing the blind to see and I'm making the lame walk and the deaf hear. And I'm giving some good news to poor people. Doesn't match up, does it? Well, which sort of a Messiah are you going to be? And the answer is, I'm going to do what John said. I'm going to do what Malachi said. I'm going to burn the wicked, yes, I've got to do it. But I'm not doing it now because I want every bit of harvest I can get. That's the answer to the subtle implications of a television program last night, which I didn't see. But I understand that Handel's Messiah was on the television last night. How, how, how many of you saw that? Quite a few. Sorry, I don't want to see the television addicts in the audience. But I gather that against the music of that matchless work, glorifying our Jesus, were portrayed horrific pictures of the sufferings of this 20th century world. Starving children in Biafra. People fighting in riots. And so against the glorious music praising the Messiah was the backcloth of 20th century evil 
Now, I don't know what the producers of that program intended, but I'm quite sure that many people found themselves asking the question, well, he's been and he's done nothing about it. Christianity has been in the world for 2,000 years and we see more evil than ever with the implication that Jesus has failed in his job. Well, the answer to that television program and the answer to every charge that Jesus has failed is this. You wait and see because he's waiting. He's saying, don't pull up the tears yet. Don't eradicate the evil yet. If you did, I'm going to lose my harvest. I found myself in Lambeth Palace Chapel on Monday morning and there was a voice singing lustily behind me as we sang the first hymn of an important service of dedication for the nationwide initiative in evangelism. I recognized that voice. It was the voice of a man who in the middle of Dartmoor prison became a Christian. Now he travels the world preaching the good news of Jesus. He has difficulty getting into some countries because though he wears a dog collar, his passport says he's an ex-convict and they usually keep him for questioning before he gets in. And I turned round and there was a lovely face of a man who, if Jesus had thrown the tares into the fire, would be in the fire. But he's part of the harvest. Now think of Jack Kramer, who was in this pulpit not long ago. And if Jesus had thrown all the tares into the harvest, into the fire, Jack would not be part of the harvest. And if we're absolutely honest, if Jesus threw all the tares into the fire, there wouldn't be one of us here tonight, would there? And so Peter in his second letter says, it may seem as if God is doing nothing about it. He has fixed the date on his calendar when he will. But praise him for his patience. There's only one reason, only one reason why he's not stepped in to put it right. And that is that he wants as many as possible to be saved. Every parable breaks down. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who had a field and therefore, in some respects, it will be unlike the man who had the field. Whenever you say this is like that, you're making a comparison in which there's a contrast. Castor sugar is like salt, but it is unlike it in taste. And whatever comparison you make, there's an unlike. The kingdom of heaven is like a field with tares growing in it and wheat growing in it. The unlike is this. Tares can be changed into wheat. That's the miracle of the Creator God in Jesus Christ. If Jesus can turn water into wine, he can take a tear and turn it into a wheat, a stalk of wheat. That's the miracle of the Gospel. And so our task in the 1980s is not that God calls us to go and eradicate evil and seek to get everyone shut up in prison who's causing others to do wrong. Our task is to see that he gets a harvest of wheat. The real thing that is wrong with Britain is not that there are too many weeds, but that there is too little wheat. And if the few Christians there are get hung up on how to uproot the tares, then there's going to be an even poorer harvest. And that is why on Monday we gathered together a unique and historic moment, the first time for centuries upon centuries that a Catholic cardinal has taken part in a service in Lambeth Palace Chapel. But there was the Archbishop of Canterbury, the leaders of the Methodists, the United Reformed, other churches, Afro-Indians were there, evangelists from all over the country were there. It was a very moving service. It turned into a prayer meeting halfway through, a spontaneous prayer meeting in the middle of Lambeth Palace. I think that might have been historic too. But we had a real sense of God's presence and he was saying to us, there's not enough wheat. There was no mention in the service of dedicating ourselves to the task of eradicating evil. Rather was there a dedication to the task of sowing seed 
and the headquarters of the nationwide initiative is in Bible House in Great Victoria Street and the Bible Society emblem is of a man sowing seed not of a man pulling up tares we are not told seek first the destruction of the kingdom of Satan and his evil and all these things will be added to you but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness the Evangelical Alliance has called us to a 5,000 strong Congress on Evangelism in April 1980 and all over Britain I sense that Christians are gearing up primarily to sow the seed of good to get more wheat growing in his field in his kingdom to see that he gets a better harvest in the 80s than he has in the 70s I said last Sunday evening in Shalford I was born in 1930 and so my childhood was spent in what I call the threatening 30s and then I spent my adolescence in the fighting 40s and then I grew up in the faltering 50s when we were trying to get the world back on an even keel and then came the swinging 60s and the sobering 70s and if you ask me what the 80s will be then I tell you they will be the empty 80s the empty 80s I dread to think what will come into that vacuum but that is why I believe God is stirring his people to say sow my seed in the 80s spread my gospel plant the wheat there are far too many tares in Britain but you're not going to give me my harvest by trying to tear them all up 